Throughout the ages, and dating back into time immemorial, one thing that has plagued humanity is possession. Whether your opinions on the issue go from it's a very real and dangerous thing, to these people are mentally ill and or are faking it. The issue is still largely shrouded in a lot of unknowns and mystery. So today, in this video, we're going to take a look at some cases of supposedly very real and terrifying demonic possession. So get ready, pull up a stump, and we'll take a dive into these cases. And as always, you can decide for yourself if these are real, fake, or somewhere in between. If you happen to like the video, then please like and subscribe. If you happen to really like the video, consider becoming a patron or making a donation to my PayPal. Both are listed in the description. Now, let's get into the video. In the late 1700s, locals of the village of Yatton, around 20 miles from Bristol in England, were rather alarmed and scared when a man by the name of George Lukens began to display increasingly bizarre behavior. The man would start spontaneously snarling like an animal or barking like a dog, as well as sing hymns backwards, sing or chant in a foreign language that the illiterate man did not know. He spoke in both the voice of a man and a woman, and would blurt out vulgar obscenities or profanity for no apparent reason. During these fits, he was also said to convulse, walk around on all fours, or appear to be thrown around by unseen hands. And this was all obviously very uncharacteristic of the man, especially the aspect of being thrown around by unseen hands. But the boy was known to be very well-mannered, calm, and cheerful even. These weird episodes were completely unpredictable and could last for up to an hour and plagued Lukens for years, forcing his family to have him put in a mental institution for 20 months where all efforts to treat him or indeed find any cause for a condition had failed. Over time, these episodes became more intense and more tinged with the paranormal. Lukens would have violent outbursts where he would claw or bite at people Sometimes he would smash items seemingly with strength far beyond his slight figure. He would speak seemingly in voices that did not belong to him, and he had an aversion for religious symbols, objects, or words. Terrified villagers began to suspect Lukens was under the influence of demonic forces, or possibly even witchcraft. And even he himself began to proclaim to anyone who would listen that he was possessed by seven distinct demonic presences that would require seven priests to eject from him. One minister by the name of Joan Valton, who long known Lukens, said of him at the time, I personally knew him, a youth about 18, short in stature and meager in aspect. He had frequent fits or paroxysms, and was sometimes affected like the Pythonesses, or rather like the Furies, mentioned often by Herodotus and ancient writers. He was cruelly distorted and uttered foul language, but was also often heard to say that he should be delivered if seven ministers should pray with him. By this point, whatever was tormenting Lucans was obviously taking a toll on his health, as he had wasted away into an emaciated, withered-looking husk of his former self, drained of all vigor, and villagers became extremely worried about him. The story of the odd, seemingly possessed man spread through the village and surrounding areas, finally coming to the attention of an Anglican reverend in Bristol by the name of Joseph Easterbrook, who was the vicar of the town's temple church. Soon after, other clergymen were informed of the possible possession, and most of them agreed it to be a possibly genuine demonic possession, but they refused to get involved, perhaps out of fear. Nevertheless, Easterbrook managed to gather together six other ministers from a movement of Protestant Christians called Wesleyanism for the purpose of arranging an exorcism for the demon-plagued boy. The exorcism was to be held at the Temple Church on June 13, 1788, the whole thing was meant to be a kind of a low-key affair that would be kept fairly secret, so this ragtag group of exorcists was no doubt very surprised when hundreds of gawkers arrived from out of morbid curiosity, fueled by stories of Lucans that had been circulating both by word of mouth 
and through the local news. According to the account of Easterbrook himself, the exorcism started with Lucan's eerily singing in a high-pitched voice, which sharply dropped and timbered to a deep, gruff one that ridiculed and berated the ministers present and told them that they would undoubtedly fail. He then started alternating between a man's voice and a woman's voice, spewing out vitriol, blasphemous rants, threats of physical violence, and even at one point, jarringly singing a love song. The demons also made it very clear that they were infuriated that these priests would want to try to exorcise them, and expressed contempt towards the boy for telling them of their evil presence within him. As this went on, other distinct voices began popping through, chattering about different things, singing, barking, growling, babbling about other nonsense, and one particularly bassy voice bragged about his vast powers. Sometimes the voices spoke pure, perfect Latin, which Lucans had absolutely no knowledge of, surprising one skeptical observer who was trained in Latin and convincing him that perhaps what he was seeing was indeed real. Lucans also sang out of a hymn of praise called Te Deum to the devil instead, proclaiming him the supreme leader and governor of all things. The haunted man came so unruly that it required two other men to hold down the boy as the minister said their prayers over his writhing, contorting body. When asked why they were torturing Lucans, one of the demons allegedly replied, so that I may show my power among men. After two hours of intense prayer and constant physical restraint, Lucans then became calm, praised God, and stated that the evil presences were gone. Now, as you might know, with most other uh, aftermath of an exorcism, controversy stormed around. Those who had been present at the exorcism were convinced that this was a genuine demonic possession, and many upstanding citizens of the village also tended to agree. However, others were not so sure. There were those who criticized the truthfulness of Lucan's, claiming that he was a well-known and clever ventriloquist, skilled as a mimic as well as an alcoholic and a prankster. Others said that Lucan's merely suffered from some form of epilepsy, which had been exaggerated by the clergy to seem more supernatural, or that the demonic possession was all part of a wholly fabricated plan by Lucan's to avoid having to get a job and work. Some other clergymen even criticized the exorcism itself, accusing the Wesleyan ministers of not having been properly ordained to engage in such a battle. Regardless of the controversy, Lucan's experienced no further incidents of demonic possession and returned to a quiet, humble life. Although he wanted to stay in Bristol, he eventually returned home to Yatton due to negative public reaction to him living there in the wake of the exorcism. He would go on to live a rather poor life with only sporadic employment as a bookseller and bill sticker, and he lived off mostly begging and government aid until he died lonely and alone. In 1805. So regardless of if the exorcism was real and he was actually indeed possessed, it's kind of sad how he died alone and lonely and didn't really have a job or anything and had to live off government handouts. Now it's also possible that no place would hire him because of the media attention that the uh, exorcism got. This is also can be related to today when someone is involved in a big scandal or something like this. Uh, nobody wants to hire them because it might give them a bad name and maybe they thought back then that if they hired him it might like bring a curse on them and it's just a bad time for everybody involved. I'm not really sure what he would gain from faking the whole thing. Um, but anyways, that's enough of my thoughts. What do you think happened? Do you think that the boy was indeed possessed? Do you think that he made the whole thing up? Do you think it was exaggerated? Or do you think that it was somewhere in between? Let me know what you think down below in the comments. So to start off this case, I'm going to say outright that I am going to get the names wrong of this because I just can't pronounce them. So anyways, let's have that in mind. So for this case, we once again need to go back a couple hundred years. This case is in the 1800s, 
and is the story of Godly Benditus, a 28-year-old resident of the rural German village of Machlingen, which is located within the Black Forest. So for the sake of myself, I will refer to the girl as D. D was brought up in a Lutheran family, and she had a very oppressively religious, highly superstitious upbringing. After her parents died when she was quite young, D lived with her siblings and continued to attend services run by a fire and brimstone, almost fanatical pastor and theologian named Johann Christoph Blumhardt. In 1842, the people living near the home where D grew up and passerby began to notice strange noises emanating from the home during the dark hours of the night, some of which sounded rather jarring and decidedly violent in nature. Suspecting that there was some sort of abuse going on, a doctor and some other locals stayed there for a night and witnessed things that they just cannot explain, such as objects or furniture moving on their own, and strange thuds, scrapes, bangs, and other poltergeist activity that seemed to issue forth from the very walls, which is a quote, leading them to the conclusion that the house was indeed very haunted. The phenomena continued, and on top of this, another strange things began to happen. D began to claim that she was being visited at night by a ghostly apparition of a woman holding a baby in her arms, and that she was prone to having sudden blackouts. On one occasion, going into an unresponsive trance-like state for an entire day before snapping out of it as if nothing happened, with no memory of what had happened at all. Whispers formed around the village that the deadest home was haunted, cursed, or somewhere in between, maybe both. Since the paranormal activity seemed to be focused most intensely on Dee herself, she was sent to live with a cousin, and the haunting apparently followed her to her new home, leaving the other siblings in peace. The young woman's plight captured the attention of Reverend Blumhardt himself, who came to visit Dee and came to the conclusion that she was in fact possessed by a demon after witnessing evidence such as convulsive fits, speaking in different voices, and intense bouts of uncharacteristic cursing and profanity. Her siblings also claimed that she would sometimes go into a trance and violently attack them for no reason, after which she would not remember a thing. Blumhardt took it upon himself to take her under his care and offer her spiritual support through her terrifying ordeal and during his regular visits, she confided in him some bizarre information indeed. Dee claimed that when she was just an infant, evil spirits had tried to kidnap her, but they were driven away by the power of her mother's protective prayers, and she also insisted that her aunt was a witch. Things eventually progressed to the point where an entity allegedly would possess Dee to speak with Blumhardt directly, during these conversations, the woman would speak in a voice that was not her own, and the spirit claimed to be the one who had visited Dee in the night. She told the pastor that she was a widow who had murdered two people during her life, and these cruel acts had drawn the devil into her, meaning that the case had become rather a curious situation of the devil possessing a spirit who was in turn possessing a human. However, this was not the only spirit who was apparently tormenting the girl, and more began to make themselves known as the months went on. Eventually, there were apparently hundreds of them residing in this one young woman. Interestingly, many of these other spirits made the same claim as the original, that they were in fact victims of demonic possession as well, with some of them claiming to have sought refuge within the woman to try and escape the evil. This alarmed Blumhardt to the point where he immediately began the ritual of exorcism, which caused an escalation in the strange phenomena surrounding the girl. She became even more violent and unruly, needing to be restrained at times. Her blasphemous ranting became worse, and she exhibited the horrifying habit of vomiting forth sand, glass, nails, and copious amounts of blood. At one point, D told the pastor that some of the possessed spirits within her had left her body to go run amok thousands of miles away, and that they were allegedly had caused an earthquake. Bizarrely, news would come not long after that that there had indeed been a devastating earthquake in the West Indies, which Dee could not have possibly known about. When only further convinced Blumhard that the possession was genuine, 
and strengthened his resolve to follow through with the exorcism to the end. The end, however, would be a long time coming. The exhausting exorcism dragged on for two years, with the demon-infested spirits becoming more and more desperate and violent as their hold on the girl weakened. Some of the spirits purportedly were especially defiant, threatening Blumhardt and his family with physical violence and even death. According to the account, these spirits actually ejected themselves willingly out of Dee in order to attack her sister, Katharina, who also became possessed much as her sister had been. Blumhardt was supposedly able to face off against both possessed women, and perhaps realizing they were no match for the priest, left the women one by one, after which Dee supposedly said, Jesus is Victor, and passed out. The exorcism and its outcome made Blumhardt into quite a celebrity, and almost a hero at the time. Hundreds of people began to flock to his church from all over the surrounding areas to hear his sermons. And of course, he did not shy away from this newfound popularity, and indeed started making bold claims that he could cast out any evil spirit at any time, and also perform healings. To this end, Blumhardt opened a retreat and a thermal spa in 1853 that was claimed to be able to cure all manner of diseases, disabilities, and health conditions. Apparently, Dee herself joined up with Blumhardt to help his cause. In 1850, Blumhardt also wrote a book about the heroin exorcism called Blumhardt's Battle that would continue to run his spa and retreat and perform faith healings for young people from far and wide until his death in 1880. So what do you think? Was it real? Was it fake? Was it simply exaggerated? Or somewhere in between? Let me know what you think down in the comments. And is it also possible that after the priest had done this supposed exorcism, that the spirits did not leave, but instead stuck around to prey on the minister's pride and other uh, things like his ego in order to get him to commit sins, such as saying that he could cast out any spirit at any time, faith healings, and all these other things. Anyways, enough of my thoughts. Tell me what you think. In 1906, a girl by the name Clara Germana Kelly was attending school at a place called St. Michael's Mission in Natal, South Africa. Clara was your everyday 16-year-old. She was fairly normal by all accounts. She was quiet, and she was just as devout and religious as her peers, despite the fact that she was unfortunately an orphan. Hearing about the girl, there was nothing at the time to indicate that anything would be amiss with her, or that there were dark forces lying in wait to gather around her. A lot of the details about what happened during this case has been taken from journals and diaries written by nuns and priests at the mission, and although it is unclear just when the incident started, it seems likely that it began with a confession Clara made one day. She allegedly told her confessor, Father Orner Erasmus, as she reached out to the devil for the purpose of forming a dark pact. Clara refused to give any details on why she had done this, but soon after, there would be a series of strange phenomena that would steadily orbit the girl. The first big anomaly was the fact that Clara, who knew no foreign languages, began to speak Polish, German, French, Latin, and others, which started off as just a few words here and there, but steadily graduated to fluent sentences and even ranting. What left everyone perplexed in the matter is that she had never demonstrated an ability nor even an interest in any of these foreign languages, even Clara claimed not to know how she was able to speak them. This was witnessed by numerous people at the mission, and it was also said that these episodes of speaking foreign languages often happened after Clara fell into a sort of a trance, and that she would sometimes not even remember what she had said or what had happened during these spells. Soon after this, Clara graduated to spontaneously spinning out the deepest, darkest secrets of those around her, even people she had never met before, including bad things they had done and impure thoughts they had had. She would revel in the most vulgar sexual fantasies that she claimed that the people of the cloth around her had had. 
many of which were confirmed in the diary entries of spooked nuns who felt that Clara could reach in their head and read their minds. She seemed to know all of their fears and various other pieces of information that she had no business knowing, and around this point it was dawning on everyone that something truly bizarre and terrifying was going on. And they would be absolutely right, because in the days that followed, Clara began to demonstrate an aversion to religious imagery, which must have been tough considering that she was in a Christian mission. She would take a roundabout pass around these objects and could not bear to be in the same room with them. If somehow she was to come into contact with such a relic, she would allegedly unleash a savage, horribly unearthly wail that one nun would describe this way. No animal has ever made such sounds, neither the lions of East Africa nor the angry bulls. At times it sounded like a veritable herd of wild beasts orchestrated by Satan had formed a hellish choir. During these times it was claimed that Clara would become extraordinarily strong, that she would throw nuns across the room, that she could barely be held down by even four people. This coincided with a general tendency for Clara to gradually transform from once quiet and even meek to an increasingly aggressive, powerful, and very confrontational personality. She would sometimes hiss, snarl, and growl at people around her, most often completely unprovoked, and the increasingly frightened nuns turned to help in order to perform an exorcism on what they were now convinced was a demon possessing a child. The two Roman Catholic priests tasked with her exorcism were named Reverend Mansuti and Reverend Erasmus, which is the aforementioned one. Uh, so they started the exorcism on Clara, and it would prove to be a rather terrifying experience from the very get-go, because one of the first things that Clara did when confronted with the duo was leap on to Reverend Mansuti and knock away his Bible and begin strangling him with his own stole. And she would have been successful too if not for a group of nuns and another priest hadn't pried her off of him. After this she began hurling things about, and at one point purportedly levitated a full five feet above the floor, prompting those present to leave her tied down. For two days the priest confronted whatever supernatural evil was residing within Clara, and through it all she showed many traits that convinced all who were present that this was not simply the work of a mentally ill child, or a lunatic, or someone just looking for attention. In addition to the levitation and the speaking in tongues, she also seemed to know when being, she was being sprayed with holy water. In order to test this, the priests even switched between holy water and regular water without Clara's knowledge. But whereas the normal water had no effect, holy water would send her into an absolute rage. The holy water, however, was apparently the key as that was what eventually cast the demon out. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I read about this case uh, a while ago, and it was mentioned that the entities that were inside of her could name where the water was coming from, like they could na like name the church, name the area, that kind of stuff, and if they gave her like just, I guess it would be the equivalent of tap water, she would know where it came from as well. It was pretty insane, really. And this time was not the end for Clara either. After the demon had left, or before the demon had left, it said that it was going to uh, leave with a display of power, which was the levitation, in front of 170 people. So after it left, uh, everything was cool and everything was going great. But in 1907, the demon came back and possessed her again, or another entity claiming to be the same entity. Another exorcism was performed, and this time it lasted again for two days. When the second ordeal was over, the demon's departure was allegedly heralded by an incredibly foul odor, which pervaded the air and sickened all that were present. However, this second exorcism would mark the last time any demon would bother Clara Germana Selle, and a after that it must have either crawled back to where it came from or went out searching for another host. Either way, what did you think of these three cases? Do you think they were real? Do you think they were fake? Do you think they were exaggerated or embellished? Or maybe a combination of all three? You let me know what you think down in the comments. And if you made it this far, then thank you for watching.
If you liked the video, please like and subscribe. And if you really like the video and like what I do, then you can become a patron or donate to my PayPal, both of which are in the description. Thank you for pulling up a stump. I hope the video found you well and have a good night.